This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Life as we know it on Earth hangs in the balance. Global climate change is accelerating. Clean water shortages are increasing. Animal and plant species are disappearing. The crisis is real. The time to act is now. But effective action first requires understanding. The University of California Natural Reserve System provides protected habitats where scientists are gaining a deeper understanding of the environment and how it is responding to the pressures of global climate change. This is the story of the research going on at one of those sites, the Heath and Marjorie Angelo Coast Range Reserve, a heavily forested 7,500-acre watershed on the South Fork of the Eel River. Thanks to the Angelo family, who moved to the area during the Great Depression, the property was never logged or developed. In 1959, the Angelos sold their land to the Nature Conservancy, who later transferred it to the University of California to become part of the natural reserve system. The reserve is a place of great beauty and serenity, but it is also a living laboratory where scientists from around the country are using ingenious new methods and advanced technologies to gain new perspectives on how the natural world functions and how localized events relate to global trends. Okay, keep going. Heavy winter rains and tectonic uplift have sculpted the rugged landscape and nurtured the reserve's rich plant and animal communities. But what would happen if that pattern should change? Will thousand-year-old trees disappear? Will salmon stop migrating? Will native ecosystems collapse? To answer these questions, scientists began working from the ground up. They first wanted to understand how the land formed on Elder Creek, a tributary of the Eel River, scientists are using new technologies to look back in time and recreate how the landscape formed. Bill Dietrich, a professor of earth and planetary science at UC Berkeley, is a leader in this effort. This is one of my favorite places on the reserve, and the reason for that is that, in essence, you're walking through time. If you look into this forest and the underlying grass, you see native California as it once was before the arrival of the European cattle and clearing of land, deforestation and agriculture. You see the old oaks and you see the grasses up to my eye height. This is an area that also is an old riverbed. So there's a deeper history here that goes back maybe 30,000 years when once this was a raging river across here. The Angelo Reserve has a number of topographic features that had long puzzled geologists. How did flat terraces form in the steep canyons? Why are the terraces so high above the current riverbed? And why are there waterfalls in soft deposits that the river should easily cut smooth? Dietrich and his colleagues are using new mapping and dating techniques to sleuth out the answers. LIDAR, light detecting and ranging, is a laser-based mapping process being refined by the National Center for Airborne Laser Mapping, or ENCOM. Based at Berkeley and at the University of Florida, ENCOM develops advanced techniques for producing maps of unprecedented detail and accuracy, specifically for scientists. The maps are created by flying over the site in a specially equipped plane, shooting a pulsing laser beam towards the ground. As the plane flies back and forth, the laser emits tens of thousands of pulses per second. Computers track the return time of each laser pulse, and technicians later filter through the data to generate the maps. The maps are revolutionary because for the first time, we're obtaining information on topography at a spatial scale we've never been able to get over a large area. With this technology, you can cover 50 square kilometers in a day and have as much as four or five data points per square meter. We can see the shapes of hillsides, the shapes of channels, 
the presence of roads, the occurrence of landslides, and we can actually see the fine details that then allow us to draw interpretations about mechanisms and also at a high enough quality that we can use such data to test theories that we can never do before. So it would be equivalent to the world having up to now been without glasses. And you, you, know, you function, you can get around, and you can sort of avoid running into trees. And you put your glasses on, and suddenly you see so much, so much more. I was completely shocked at what I saw. Because the standard topographic maps would use an aerial photograph and the technology then of estimating ground elevation by trying to see through the trees. When the LIDAR uh, data came back and we had the bare topography, you could see that the landscape looked drastically different. Everywhere you look, there are very large, deep landslides that at various times in the past have moved and radically altered the topography. You walk around here and think, this landscape is very disorganized, but it didn't make any sense. And as soon as we had this data, you could just begin to see how the landscape worked. And so that revealing, that unveiling, really, of seeing the landscape for the first time um, as it really looks, as compared to an interpretation, and at a detail that allows us to, well, propose processes, test theories, it's a revolution, and it's revolutionizing the field. One key to understanding the Angelo landscape is the fact that it is made up largely of two very different kinds of rock deposits, mudstone and sandstone. Mudstone is what it sounds like. It's silt and clay pushed together. And sandstone is also what it sounds like. Sand is pushed together. These, the sand and the mud were deposited together in a, in a deep marine environment millions of years ago by underwater landslides. And that sediment was then compressed and pushed and squeezed and shoved on shore by tectonic processes, eventually ending up where it is now, standing on end like books, with most of the pages in the book being mudstone, but occasionally some of the pages being sandstone. Here is the mudstone. And in my hand, I can grind it up and break it. It's mechanically very weak. When it wets and dries, it falls apart. The consequence is a river can cut through this mudstone like butter. In contrast, the sandstone is hard. There are big boulders of sandstone sitting behind me here covered with moss. All the gravel of the river, all the boulders of the river are sandstone. As rivers cut down in response to the land being pushed up, the land steepens up. And as it becomes steep enough, this weak mudstone simply collapses and gives way and generates huge, deep landslides that flow episodically toward the channel and dump vast quantities of sediment in the river system. So if the river cuts through the mudstone so easily, Dietrich wondered, then why isn't its bed smooth? Why would a waterfall form in a mudstone channel? What happens is the sandstones drop in enough gravel that they armor or protect the mudstone and, and slow or stop the incision. And what can happen is the waterfall can be steep enough that it can propagate underneath the boulders and the boulders fall over. So this waterfall can slowly migrate upstream through the mudstone and undermine the boulders. And as we walk down river, we can find emerging from the riverbed rock above our head with sediment on top of it, which records the river at a higher level, and we can walk all the way to the South Fork Eel River. This suggests that this waterfall started in the South Fork Eel River a couple of kilometers away and slowly, slowly moved up this way, in, in a sense, unzipping the riverbed, exposing it once again, and then getting mantled again with boulders. The periodic cutting of the river also has another major impact on the topography. At times, when the river cannot cut through a sandstone mantle, it tends to shift from side to side, creating wide, flat areas. Then, when it reaches the mudstone, it cuts down quickly, leaving behind elevated terraces. What this points to is a dynamic interaction between the river and the hill slope that's influenced by climate. Now, recent studies by colleagues at the University of Minnesota, in which they've used a new dating technology have given us dates for the first time of the deposits in these abandoned terraces. 
and they show that these deposits came in in the late Pleistocene when we know that the climate here was much wetter. And what this suggests is that during wet times, tremendous amount of sediment comes down this river canyon. And there are places here where the deposits are six meters thick. And we can find big debris flow deposits. We can find rock avalanches that have tumbled down here. And presently, the, the uh, climate is much drier than it was during the Pleistocene and perhaps less stormy. Across this landscape, there are large, deep landslides that are mostly just sitting, having moved in the past but not moving presently. They're slumbering and they'll be reawakened if more rain comes. And one of our great interests is will they reawaken when climate changes? Because some predictions have this landscape getting wetter. And is it possible that even in my lifetime, these large landslides that are all over the landscape will start moving again and dumping vast quantities of sediment in. It would not be good for roads, it would not be good for people's houses, but it would be exciting. LIDAR maps reveal unprecedented details about the bare earth, as well as the patterns of the trees and shrubs that cover the landscape. Scientists from the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, NSAID, based at the University of Minnesota, are using this data to explore the interplay between the topography and the animals and plants that live on the land. How fast can a stream current flow before underwater grazers are washed away? How does the availability of sunlight change the river food web in different parts of the watershed? Where do threatened steelhead get nutrients in the dark headwater streams? Predictive mapping, using topographic data to predict environmental regimes, is helping scientists find answers to these questions. Mary Power is a professor of integrative biology at UC Berkeley. We are taking advantage of the technology and the mapping skills that they've provided to follow food web interactions up the drainage network, moving from sunny mainstem, warm, productive habitats upstream where it's cooler and darker but tends to stay more moist. Organisms like lizards that are favored in hot sunny environments become slowed down and less important in the dark habitats. And organisms like spiders that are abundant and important in the dark moist habitats start to desiccate and drop out in the dry habitat. So you can have the same characters in the food web but their relative importance and the strengths of their interactions change. And so in our attempts to take advantage of earth science for predictive ecological mapping, we're looking at the thresholds for where an ecological regime changes. Where can a grazer like a tadpole or a grazing caddisfly control algae? And where is its presence irrelevant to whether algae accrues or not? Where can bats effectively track emerging insects like mosquitoes and where is the drainage suddenly so steep that the white noise jams bat ultrasound and they become ineffective? Angela Reserve is a fantastic place to study predictive mapping. Because we have such steep gradients that occur over short distances, we can get to them all in a day or two days. We can study drainages that are a half a square kilometer and just maybe 10 inches wide to this drainage here which is the main stem South Fork Eel that has an active winter channel of about 30 meters and a summer channel of about 20 meters wide. So we tend to repeat the same experiments, whether it's studies of alders, of caddisflies grazing algae, of bats tracking insect emergence. So we're repeating those experiments at the same eight or nine watersheds to get contrasts to see where there are breaks in ecological outcomes with drainage area, and then trying to interpret why they occurred, and with that, hoping to find ourselves in a position to predict what would happen in the future were environmental conditions to shift around because of climate change, land use, or biology. That's the philosophy of predictive mapping. LIDAR mapping isn't the only advanced technology being used by the NSAID team. They're also using stable isotopes to track minute changes in oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon atoms that reveal an animal's food sources. 
Jacques Finley, an associate professor of ecology at the University of Minnesota, is leading this effort. Stable isotopes are one very useful tool that we've been able to uh, make a lot of progress in terms of um, mapping out feeding relationships uh, between organisms. Um, some stable isotopes act as conservative tracers, so once they get into a food web, we can uh, follow them through the food web and actually see um, how carbon, organic matter, is moving through the food web on up to, to top predators, salmon and steelhead. This NSAID collecting team is making its way to a headwater stream in the reserve to collect samples for a study on how the steelhead diet varies across the watershed. Camille McNeely, an ecologist from Eastern Washington University, heads the team. One thing that's important is we never want to mix riffle and pool bugs. So some of these bugs, like the mayflies and the stoneflies, will find both in pools and riffles. And we just want to have a separate vial for the ones from the pools. From the We're trying to understand what uh, fish eat in this watershed. And this goes back to some of Jacques Finley's work from his dissertation, where he found a pattern where there's a really sharp transition in the watershed between predators, including fish and also invertebrate predators, that use terrestrial carbon. Somehow it makes its way through the food web once it falls in the stream, and they're supported by terrestrial carbon in small streams, algal carbon in large streams, and there seems to be a fairly sharp transition at about 10 square kilometer drainage area. And so what we're interested in doing now is trying to explain that pattern. I mean, it makes sense that there's a transition, but why does it happen where it does, and why is it so sharp? I guess what really interests me is not just explaining that transition, but we're talking about predators and the energy that sustains them. It's being fixed by plants, either terrestrial plants or primary producers in the stream, algae. And they're not eating plants, they're eating something else. And so I'm interested in the pathways through which that carbon and energy is moving through the food web to get to the predators and how that changes. One possibility is that they're feeding on terrestrial bugs that just fall directly into the stream and then at some point maybe those are not so abundant as the canopy gets wider over the streams. Another possibility is that they're feeding on bugs that live and grow up in the stream but that are sustained by detrital inputs themselves. And then another possibility is that um, there's dissolved organic carbon that comes into the streams as groundwater and that leaches out of leaves and stuff like that. And that supports slime on rocks, which we might superficially expect to be algae, but actually in a lot of the streams, a lot of it is bacterial. So it may be that bugs are feeding on that, then, and then fish are feeding on those bugs. All right, fish folk, are we organizing down here? Yes, sir. One group focuses on finding steelhead. That's it, I can't. They capture the fish with a quick electric shock, sedate them, and flush out the contents of their digestive systems with water. Then they weigh and measure each fish before returning it unharmed to the stream. Standard length, 112. 24.96. Meanwhile, another group is collecting live insects that can be matched isotopically with their partially digested colleagues. When we look at the bugs, we'll see if they're they terrestrial bugs, if they're aquatic bugs. Um, what do we know about the diets of those aquatic bugs? We've actually done quite a bit of pretty intensive work on the diets of some of these. And so we know which bugs the fish are eating, then we'll know, are they biofilm feeders? Are they detritus feeders? Are they algivores, et cetera? Throughout an animal's life, its diet is recorded isotopically in its body tissue. Because terrestrial plants and aquatic algae have distinct isotopic fingerprints, the scientists hope they will be able to trace the steelhead's food energy source all the way back to the point where the carbon was fixed in the environment. After a long day of collecting, the team's work is still not done. In the evening, they return to the reserve's laboratory, where they work late into the night, 
sorting and preparing the specimens they've collected, removing their protective cases, and placing them in clean water overnight to flush out their digestive tract. To get good data on isotopes and nutrient content, we really just want to know what the bug tissue is. We're not interested in their last meal. And so we're going to keep them overnight in the lab and hopefully allow all the material they've eaten to pass through their system. We're trying to understand some basic aspects of food webs, how fish that are in fact listed as threatened feed themselves and survive in these streams. Mary Power and her colleagues have worked for decades on the South Fork of the Eel River, investigating the relationship between the forest, the stream, and most recently, the atmosphere. It's been wonderful to work at the Angela Reserve and also to get to know and to learn from the locals who've spent their life around the river. One thing they've wondered about is why some years there are great big algal blooms and why some years the river looks relatively barren without much algae. Intrigued by this question, Power built a series of enclosures in the river. She removed all of the larger carnivorous fish that fed on the river's algae grazers from some of the enclosures and monitored them through an entire summer. The results were surprising. We discovered early on in the late 80s, actually, a very strong and surprising link that steelhead trout that are purely carnivorous have a whopping big impact on algae that are plants. It turned out that the steelhead are eating insects and the insects then affect algae either directly or indirectly. This was the first documentation in rivers, to my knowledge, of a trophic cascade, a, a strong pathway that links predators through their intermediate prey to the biomass or the abundance of plants. By feeding heavily on the algae eating insects, the steelhead were indirectly helping to produce heavy algae blooms in the river. Excited by her discovery, Power attempted to repeat the experiment the following summer. The second year, we didn't see this strong effect of fish on algae. Um, whether fish were present or absent in our experiments, the algae collapsed really soon, and we were completely puzzled and actually a little, a little agitated because it's not good before tenure not to be able to repeat your experiments. Power poured over the possibilities. Was there a flaw in her first year's experiments? Were there other unknown factors that controlled algae growth? What had she overlooked? Finally, it dawned on her. When we opened our eyes, we noticed that that year was different climatically, that unlike the winter preceding our first experiments, it hadn't rained enough the following winter to move the bed and scour the riverbed and, and purge the river of aquatic insects. It turns out there's one long-lived armored grazer that gets over an inch long that survives in great numbers during these drought years, and it can clobber the algae whether fish are present or absent. It's invulnerable to fish predation. So after drought years, in drought regimes, fish are completely irrelevant to the fate of algae that summer. Power was becoming intrigued with the algae and its role in the river food web. She soon discovered its impact extended beyond the river into the surrounding forest. So what difference does it make whether we have a big algae year or a low algae barren year? Well, one really important effect is that it will affect how many insects emerge out of these algal mats. Turns out these insects are really important food for a lot of predators we thought were terrestrial, like lizards, spiders, and bats. A lot of those species are tracking insect emergence, and they get a lot more food when the algae are blooming. So when you look around the watershed, you see that most of the plant biomass is in trees, and of course there's a lot more dry area than river area, so you'd think the forest would feed the river largely, but in situations like this, the river feeds the forest by mediating these aquatic insect emergences that are tracked by so many predators. The primary algae in the river is a species of Cladophora. Power noticed that it changed colors dramatically through the year. She began talking to colleagues about the implications of these changes. So when you start paying attention to the algae that's feeding this whole food web and a lot of the watershed too, you'll notice that it undergoes these dramatic color changes over time in the river. It starts out this pretty emerald green color. And of course, it's still important to the food web, but it's not very nutritious. It provides cover, um, places for insects to hide. So it's important, but it becomes even more important to the food web 
when it turns yellow, like this mat. So this mat now is covered with diatoms, little cells much smaller than the Clodophora that encrust it and are very high quality food, just stuffed with lipids in particular. These are the golden brown algae. And these occur, the mats turn yellow in their first few weeks or month of life. But as time goes on, the same mats turn from that yellow to a vivid, rusty red color. And that's a different epiphyte that's starting to cover over the original diatoms. It's again a diatom, but it's a very strange one that has endosymbiotic blue-green algae in it. This diatom we call epithemia, and working with both ecosystem experts and algal experts at the eel now, we're learning that this partnership of a diatom that contains cyanobacteria and then uses the Clodophora to have more surface area to grow on, that partnership is allowing the atmosphere to feed the food web in the river. 80% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. Though nitrogen is a critical nutrient for both animals and plants, atmospheric nitrogen is largely unavailable as food. In fact, the lack of nitrogen in the Eel River limits the growth of the organisms that live there. The cyanobacteria that live in the diatoms, that live in the algae, perform the critical role of fixing nitrogen, converting it to a form usable by other organisms. Jill Welter, one of Power's former postdoctoral researchers, worked with her in studying the role of the river algae. Now a professor at St. Catherine University in Minnesota, Welter brings her students to the Angelo Reserve to continue this work. As we've been studying the availability of nitrogen here in the watershed, our uh, focus has really turned toward nitrogen fixation and what factors, environmental factors, influence the rates of nitrogen fixation here in the watershed. And this is a very important um, element of our work because nitrogen fixation is the ultimate source of new nitrogen to the stream ecosystem. So this summer, we're just starting some preliminary work to measure the actual nitrogen fixation rates on green versus yellow versus the rusty red Clodophora and see uh, how big of a difference it makes. And we have some preliminary data now, hot, hot off the presses, uh, that suggest that we do see a, an increase as we go from the young, green, healthy Clodophora to the yellow. There's an increase in nitrogen fixation rates and a great big jump as we move to the rusty red. So that suggests to us that as the Clodophora becomes colonized by these other organisms, we see a big jump in the amount of new nitrogen that's entering this watershed. What we want to understand is how the pieces fit together, how the changing environmental context influences the amount of new nitrogen that's entering the river, how high precipitation years versus low precipitation years, the amount of scour, influences the amount of Clodophora and its condition and how that feeds back on the density of those nitrogen fixers and the amount of nitrogen that we see here in the river. Both Power and Welter are excited about their research findings, both for the scientific discovery itself and also for the teaching opportunities it provides. Each summer I would collaborate with a team of undergraduate students from St. Catherine, which is a women's college in Minnesota, and I think it's a really great opportunity to bring more women into environmental science. I think there's a, a lot of uh, great interest in young people today in, in getting involved in uh, environmental science, and the Angela is a great place to, to bring students so they can really see what it's like. This is a really vibrant place. There are scientists doing all kinds of work, geology, hydrology, ecology, plant biology, and it really takes this interdisciplinary team to do this kind of work. As for their research, Power is already planning the next phase. We're really excited that the algae changed color and that the color is so related to the ecological function. So because you can see from many feet away that the algae is green, yellow, or red, we're starting to experiment with getting overhead surveillance of this so we can map it out over space. We hope that maybe low-flying aircraft could photograph wide reaches and keep track of these color changes. Also, the dramatically detailed information we're getting on topography from LIDAR will help. We should be able to predict where in a watershed the algal mats will be important in the sunny, low-lying rivers, and where, as you go up into steeper, darker watersheds, they'll stop being important. That puts you in a position to predict, then, 
what might be the change on all this if, for example, we had a forest fire and lost forest cover, you'd expect the mats would creep up slope into formerly dark areas. Climate change will have a major impact on the towering redwood and Douglas fir forests of Northern California. Hey, Peter, on rope, but not moving yet. Okay. Many of the tall trees at the Angelo Reserve have been rigged with ropes so researchers can study what's happening in the canopy high above the forest floor. Emily Lim is a fourth year graduate student at UC Berkeley. Okay, I'm coming up, Peter. Fortunately, getting into the canopy gets easier the more you do it. It's like anything else, it's a type of exercise, but it is like doing squats up the tree. So it takes a lot of cardiovascular strength and flexibility to hang in a harness all day. The canopy provides an incredible experience for any field biologist. It dramatically changes your perspective of the forest. To see what the trees are actually experiencing in terms of their climate day to day is dramatically different from what we see when we're standing on the ground. The light is different, the leaves look different, we see the birds flying on the same level that they're flying. It's very, very fun, but also it makes you realize that our perspective is limited because we're on the ground. The trees are also equipped with platforms for staging equipment and making observations. Osprey, Osprey going right up river. I got it. Researchers move up and down in the canopy via narrow rope ladders and cross cable bridges to move from tree to tree across the canyon. Lim studies how plants use water. She's climbing into the canopy today to check a sap sensor that monitors how much water the tree is using. Her particular focus is on how the forest deals with the dry California summer. So understanding the changes in water use throughout the year is critical. Redwoods have a really tough job. They have to extract water out of the ground and bring it all the way up to their leaves. That can be 70, even 100, 115 meters in some of the tallest redwood trees. And they do that because water is constantly evaporating. We call it transpiration. It's constantly leaving the leaves at the top of the canopy. And that creates tension in the water column. And that tension keeps bringing the water up out of the ground. When a fog event comes in, the wetting of the canopy actually stops that stress and that tension. It relieves it because they take some of that water in. And so the tension eases not only from the top, but also from the bottom. The wood of the redwood tree is built to have specialized cells that help the water move under tension without that water column breaking. And water is a phenomenal material that actually has a lot of strength in itself. And so it can be stretched quite a bit without breaking. To determine where plants are getting their water, Lim clips small branches and brings them back to the Berkeley campus for testing. Water has an inherent signature that we call the stable isotope composition of the water, and it reflects where the water came from. So we can actually tease apart whether water came from fog or it came from the ground. Does it reflect winter rains or deep groundwater? And when we sample plant tissue, we can use a mixing model and determine what proportion came from which source. I became interested in specifically how fog brings needed water to the redwood forest during the summer months here in California when we don't get rains typically. I wanted to take a closer look at the plants growing on the forest floor in the understory to understand how they are also using the fog water. The plant diversity in the understory is what's most likely going to be affected with climate change. The forest canopy is a major control factor on what happens throughout the forest. The canopy sets the stage for what the understory sees. It not only changes light levels, but it intercepts the fog water when it moves in off the ocean and drips the water into the understory. So understanding how water enters the canopy and drips to the understory is an integral part of understanding how all the plants in the redwood forest function. 
but plants have to have light in order to make sugars so that they have enough food. But to be able to do that, plants in the understory have to have large leaves, and large leaves inherently lose a lot of water. So plants in the understory must have a lot of water, and they are going to be very impacted by any change in water availability. If they don't have enough water, they won't be able to make the type of leaves that they need to survive in the shade. Lim is particularly interested in the sword ferns on the forest floor. Sword fern is the plant in the redwood forest that's most able to take in water directly through its leaves. When a fog event comes in and wets the understory, that plant absorbs a lot of that water, and it responds strongly to it physiologically. And this plant not only is taking in a lot of water, but it also loses a lot of water. So it desperately depends on this water resource here in the fog belts in California. When I come to study sword fern, one of the first things that I do is to figure out how hydrated the plants are, to find out if they're under a lot of water stress right now at the time point when I'm measuring them. And to do that, I take a small segment of the leaf and I clip it off, and I'm able to measure how much water is in the leaf based on the time when I cut it. And by knowing how hydrated they are, I understand if they've had enough water in the last few days, last few weeks, and I can I compare how that level changes over the course of the fog season. Lim's work has revealed surprising information about how the plants use water through the year. In the redwood forests that experience regular wetting from fog events, we find that sword fern becomes more and more hydrated with the more fog that it receives. It's actually the most water stress in the spring after rain events have stopped for the winter. But then as summer comes and fog comes rolling in off the ocean over and over throughout the summer, the plant becomes more and more hydrated. And often at the end of summer, when other plants are very water stressed, sword fern, because it's been using that resource, is extremely well hydrated and performing well. Fog is a difficult climate phenomenon to predict. We have a good idea of when it will occur over short time scales, but it seems over longer trends, it's been declining. And we don't know why that is. Over the last 50 years, fog frequency has been decreasing. If the redwood forest receives less water, it's going to have a lot more trouble maintaining the life diversity that it has now. We may see a change in species composition. And so I'm interested in understanding how the dominant plants in the redwood forest respond to water. If we know how much water they need to survive, we'll be able to predict if conditions change and they receive less water, whether they'll be able to continue to live the way they are and function the way they are now. A long-term study in the reserve South Meadow is testing the impact of predicted rainfall changes on the grassland ecosystem. Blake Suttle, who began the experiment as a graduate student at UC Berkeley, is now a lecturer at Imperial College in the United Kingdom. I was reading a lot of forecasts for how climate change was likely to affect different ecosystems in California. There are a number of different approaches that use you know, predictive modeling to, to, to gain some sort of prospective understanding of how climate change will impact this species or that species, or this ecosystem type or that ecosystem type. And there's obviously, that's, that's kind of critical information for us to know. Suttle decided to replicate the predicted rainfall changes in two of the most respected forecasts. Both called for increased rainfall for the northern California coast. They differed, however, in the timing. I took the endpoints of each of those model predictions and basically decided to simulate an intensification of our current winter rainy season or an extension of that rainy season into the spring and summer and look at how each of those scenarios would affect grassland biodiversity and composition. And so what I've done is buried a network of irrigation pipe out in this grassland system and all of that irrigation pipe leads to a series of valves at the side of the meadow. Um, that connect to a 4,500 liter irrigation tank high on the hillside up behind us. And that tank is gravity fed by a stream so that it's constantly replenished with water. Suttle laid out 36 test plots across the meadow and randomly applied three rainfall treatments. Ambient rainfall plots where no additional watering was done, more intensive rainfall plots, and extended rainfall plots. Once these treatments were established, he began sampling the plots regularly. Now here's where we really see the value of a protected research reserve. In these, each of these is a permanent plot and these plots have been in place uh, with the irrigation system since the winter of 2000, 2001. 
So we're just completing our eighth year of this experiment in a completely protected setting devoted to ecological research. Now inside these permanent plots, I have a number of different types of samples that I need to take. So I have these quarter meter squared permanent subplots, 12 of them in every one of these plots. And several times a year, we'll come into these plots and take a series of measurements. For example, this is a homemade point frame uh, made by a collaborator of mine on this project, Meredith Thompson, who was a fellow graduate student at UC Berkeley. Now we come in and we line up those nails with the top of this point frame, and we come and we drop pins successively, one after the other. And as we do that, we ask what the first piece of plant material, what the first species is that the pin hits on its way down, what it lands on, and what it hits at a point three centimeters up the pin. With so much detail into plant responses, we also want to know what happens to the things that depend on the plants, things that eat the plants, and the things that eat the things that eat the plants. I measure ground-dwelling invertebrates in the system, things like spiders, beetles, everything that's crawling around on the ground using pitfall traps. The other group of invertebrates that we want to collect out here are the foliar and flying invertebrates. So the things that are flying against low to the ground and the things that are living up in the canopy of some of the vegetation. Looks like we've got mostly grasshoppers, katydids, a couple of small wasps, and a crab spider. Suttle's intensive sampling and long-term focus have produced a series of startling results. The most striking initial feature of the results that we got out here was the importance of seasonality. Basically, you have a system that gets over 200 centimeters of rain every year. A little bit over 80 inches is our average rainfall. If virtually the entirety of that rainfall falls in November, December, January, February, March, and I come out and dump another two centimeters every three days for three months, that's not a very pronounced shift. There are very few discernible differences between these winter edition plots and the plots that just receive ambient rainfall each year. On the other hand, if it stops raining in the middle of March and I come out here and dump two centimeters of rainfall on 12 of these plots every three days through April, May, and June when it's otherwise very dry, well, that has really dramatic impacts on the abundance of a lot of different plant and animal species out here. So what we saw early on in the experiment was this explosion of diversity and production two to three times greater inside those plots than outside. In the first year, almost all of the plant species benefited when Subtle extended the rainy season, but that soon changed. The strongest response happened to be by a little species of legume called Lotus micranthus. Now this is a plant that has sort of the special capability of fixing atmospheric nitrogen and turning it into basically plant fertilizer. So this plant harbors in its roots these bacteria that are able to convert nitrogen gas into a plant available form. So the result was this big increase of this one species, Lotus micranthus. Now the plants that are known to benefit the most from nitrogen fertilization in California grasslands are some of the annual grasses. Now these are plants that came over from the Mediterranean. They're all, most annual, annual grasses in California are exotic species. Um, one of them that's a particular sponge for nitrogen is this grass Bromus diandris, or rip gut brome. The longer term response was for some of these winter annual grasses to accumulate so much biomass that they dominated the system, basically smothering out most of the wildflowers that are of greater conservation value. So we're left with a system that's basically a blanket of exotic plants that show very little, if any, response to the water addition itself. As Subtle continued the experiment, the extended rainfall plots became more distinct, not just from the other treatments, but from each other as well. Now you see that this plot stayed really green relative to most of the rest of the grassland, and it's largely dominated by this one species called sheep sorrel. Now this is a spring addition plot, or one of those that's received extended rainfall for the last eight years, and it's the only one where this plant is dominating. If we look at the closest spring addition plot to this one, what we would find is a cover of mosses and this exotic annual grass, ripgut brome. If we went more over, we would see a field of the native perennial bunch grass. If we went all the way to the far side of the meadow, what we'd see is a carrot relative uh, mixed in with a lot of geranium, a wildflower. So what we're left with eight years into this experiment 
I've shifted rainfall in a highly simplified way, and we're essentially getting 12 communities moving in 12 directions different from each other. It's emerging such that you know, one species is coming to dominate in one plot and another species is coming to dominate in another plot. It almost seems like chaotic dynamics where there's this very high sensitivity to initial conditions and maybe to slight differences in things like soil, nitrogen, and other nutrients. What that tells me is that prediction of climate change impacts a priori is far more complex than we would like it to be. It really is going to depend on any number of factors that can govern the trajectory of a given species or a given community type through time in response to something like a change in rainfall. And it probably becomes more complex still when we're talking about not just rainfall changing, but temperature, carbon dioxide. And this is all happening against a backdrop of enormous human modification of the natural world. We need to not kind of, of, of neglect this complexity. We need to embrace it. We need to accept that this is how the natural world operates and use that as our starting point rather than our caveat. And then we can begin to generate predictions that are both realistic and reliable. Although 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water, plants and animals can use only a small fraction of that water. Current climate models predict major disruptions of fresh water supplies around the globe. The Keck Hydro Watch Center, funded by the W.M. Keck Foundation, is using the Angelo Reserve to gain a deeper understanding of the hydrologic cycle and field test techniques for predicting the availability of fresh water. Their work could also have a profound impact on the accuracy of future global climate models. Inez Fung is the leader of the Hydro Watch team. I asked what I thought was a very simple question. How old is the water in the stream? Is it from yesterday's rain? Is it from last year's rain or this season's rain? Or is it 100,000 years old? I don't really know. Uh, and so this is, this is what we're trying to figure out is how long the soils can hold on to the water, how much of it comes out through the trees and through evaporation from the soil return to the atmosphere, and what is the size of this reservoir beneath our feet. Rain falling in a watershed can take many paths. It can be intercepted by the forest canopy or fall on shallow soils and evaporate back into the atmosphere. It can sink into the soil, be taken up by plants, and be transpired back into the atmosphere. Or it can flow deep into the ground, be stored in the rocks, feed a nearby stream, and eventually return to the ocean. The moisture that returns to the atmosphere will often fall again as either rain or snow in a different watershed. The HydroWatch team, which includes atmospheric chemists, plant physiologists, soil scientists, water hydrologists, climate modelers, and electrical engineers, is studying every phase of the hydrologic cycle. Todd Dawson is a plant physiologist with the team. The thing that really draws me into this project and the thing I'm, I'm most uh, intrigued about is really looking at the life cycle of water from its origins at the ocean as it moves onto land and it, and it falls into watersheds. What's the fate of that water then? What gets into the groundwater? What runs off in the stream? How much of it is snow? How much of it is fog? How much of it is rain? How much of it is used by the trees? What gets stored? and all the chemistry and the dynamics of that movement of water. And that's something that just hasn't been done very often. And I think it's largely because it requires a whole variety of different types of tools and expertise. And so any one investigator would only be looking at one piece of that. They wouldn't be able to look at the entire picture. And the HydroWatch project is really focused on trying to look at the whole picture. And so, and hopefully we succeed. The area's heavy winter rains and long, dry summers make the Angelo Reserve an ideal laboratory for studying how ecosystems use water and how that changes with the seasons. You got it, yeah, you got a bullseye there. One of the objectives that we have as the plant biologists in the project is to get our instrumentation into the trees themselves. So first what we have to do is get ropes up in the trees and often we ask an arborist or someone on our team to rig the trees. Once those ropes are into the trees, then we can take up into the canopies, the solar panels that help us charge the batteries that run 
much of the equipment that we use on the site. And then we can also take up these little wireless nodes as we climb up on the ropes, and we can put them in various places within the canopy. So we can keep it inside the canopy, we can put it out on the outer edge of the canopy, which is more sunlit, we can put some near the ground, some at the very top of the tree. And that's a really critical component for this watershed study. There's so much microclimatic variation down through the canopy that we really need to understand what is the magnitude of that variation. How much does humidity and temperature vary over the course of a season, over the course of a day? Because those are the drivers for water moving out of the forest. In addition to monitoring how the trees use water, the team is also following water movement under the ground. So for example, over here, we have what we call resistance probes. And these go down uh, to two meters, and they're at 10 centimeter intervals, giving us a pattern of how water is wetting, drying up the rock below. We also have wells. This well goes down to about uh, 30 meters. And the reason that we have this well in here, like the seven other wells, is that we want to get in uh, to the ground as far down as possible, as deep as possible, to see how uh, the water table responds to rainfall events, and then how it responds over the long, dry summers. Data from all the different sensors flow to radio transmitters and are relayed back to the UC Berkeley campus where researchers can monitor the changes in real time. The ultimate goal is to provide a model for monitoring watersheds throughout the state and across the country. So what we're talking about here is developing not just the data, but the prototype for monitoring. So the modes will be automatic. We can place them, we go out to the field, we figure out where to put them, and then they could transmit the data in real time. So you can check, they beam the data home every night, and so you can sit and check whether they're all working and what is happening, and if there's a rainstorm coming, you can go and change the frequency of data transmission. The team doesn't just track the amount of water flowing through the watershed, they also trace the water's history. Staff at the Center for Stable Isotope Biogeochemistry on the Berkeley campus can track the path water takes through the hydrologic cycle. As water undergoes evaporation, condensation, or even sublimation into things like snow or ice, it changes its isotope value. When it changes its value and it falls into the environment, we can use it like a tracer, just like you would use dye to see where those plants are actually getting their water from. Is it deep groundwater? Is it surface water? Is it fog water, for example? Each of those have a unique stable isotope fingerprint, if you will, that we can trace through the trees and trace through the watershed. And so that's, that's a measure of how much the plants transpire. Fung and the other modelers on the team will use the data collected in their wireless watershed to build models that will allow them to predict water availability, much like meteorologists use satellites to predict the weather. We do hope that we get differences uh, among years during this watershed study, because what that does is it allows us to run the model using different parameters. And if you have the different parameters, that gives you the power then to make better predictions. The team's work will also have a major impact on global climate models. Until now, soil moisture has been a missing element in these models. The HydroWatch collaboration is already producing new insights about how plants use water. Roots of plants are probably the most flexible organ that a, a plant makes. They pretty much can put them wherever they want and they're really about finding resources. So roots will grow towards water, they'll grow towards nutrients. When they find that water, for example, then they can shift it around and move it in different ways, not only towards the leaves, which uh, are undergoing transpiration, but they can shift it around within their root system as well. So for example, many plants that live in Mediterranean types of climates, like we here, have here in California, they have a set of roots that are very deep for exploiting moisture during the dry summer periods where it's really stored, say in the groundwater or perhaps in this rock um, water that we're trying to quantify. They'll move some of that water up and sometimes they'll redistribute it into the shallow roots that are taking up nutrients. And so there's this really interesting dynamic of water movement. The question that has always baffled me is why some trees can withstand a drought. And that's one of the things that we're after. And one of the surprises that we have found so far is that the trees may be more resourceful than we had anticipated. 
that the roots actually dig down to hunt for water and they fracture the rocks and so in so doing enable their own survival through a drought. And so if that is the case, uh, then that is something that we're not, we do not have in the models, is this very smart IQ of trees. Scientists have been developing climate models for more than two decades. Unfortunately, many of the predictions in their models have already been realized. Fung's ultimate goal is to avoid the troubles she sees looming in the future. We've been predicting climate change for over 25 years. It is scary when the ice sheets melt, when the glaciers melt, and this is part of our prediction. It is scary when we see more severe storms, when we see temperature changes that are consistent with our predictions. One of the reasons I'm so keen about this project is that we have to bring it down to the scale of how people use water, how much water will be available to them, how much rainfall there's going to be, and what the stream flow is going to be in the future. So it's not just about global warming on the global scale uh, uh, for the year 2100, but it is more about the availability, how the global warming will change the water availability to people in the next two or three decades. A major transition is transforming the natural sciences. As environmental problems deepen and expand, scientists are learning to work together in multidisciplinary teams to address complex regional questions. Field researchers' traditional tools are now supplemented by advanced technologies such as LIDAR mapping, stable isotope analysis, and wireless sensor networks. The Angelo Reserve provides a focal point for a number of critical research efforts. Some of the nation's most accomplished scientists center their work in this living laboratory. A researcher once referred to field stations as places where nature can be studied in the language in which it was written. By deepening our understanding of the natural world, we can develop more accurate predictions and more effective solutions to the world's pressing environmental problems. Mm -hmm.